Story eleven of Wounds in the Rain War Stories by Stephen Crane. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Story eleven The Second Generation Parts four through six. Four. Senator Cadogan paced to and fro in his private parlour and smoked small brown weak cigars. These little wisps seemed utterly inadequate to console such a ponderous satrap. It was the evening of the 1st of July, 1898, and the senator was immensely excited, as could be seen from the superlatively calm way in which he called out to his private secretary, who was in an adjoining room. The voice was serene, gentle, affectionate, low. Baker, I wish you'd go over again to the War Department and see if they've heard anything about Casper. A very bright-eyed, hatchet-faced young man appeared in a doorway, pen still in hand. He was hiding a nettle-like irritation behind all the finished audacity of a smirk, sharp, lying, trustworthy young politician. "'I've just got back from there, sir,' he suggested. The Scalmulligan war-horse lifted his eyes, and looked for a short second into the eyes of his private secretary. It was not a glare or an eagle glance. It was something beyond the practice of an actor. It was simply meaning. The clever private secretary grabbed his hat and was at once enthusiastically away. "'All right, sir,' he cried. "'I'll find out.' The War Department was ablaze with light, and messengers were running. With the assurance of a retainer of an old house, Baker made his way through much small-caliber vociferation. There was rumor of a big victory. There was rumor of a big defeat. In the corridors, various watchdogs arose from their armchairs and asked him of his business in tones of uncertainty which in no wise compared with their previous habitual deference to the private secretary of the war horse of Scalmulligan. Ultimately, Baker arrived in a room where some kind of head clerk sat writing feverishly at a roll-top desk. Baker asked a question, and the head clerk mumbled profanely without lifting his head. Apparently, he said, how in the blankety-blank blazes do I know? The private secretary let his jaw fall. Surely some new spirit had come suddenly upon the heart of Washington, a spirit which Baker understood to be almost defiantly indifferent to the wishes of Senator Cadogan, a spirit which was not courteously oily. What could it mean? Baker's fox-like mind sprang wildly to a conception of overturned factions, changed friends, new combinations. The assurance, which had come from experience of a broad political situation, suddenly left him, and he would not have been amazed if someone had told him that Senator Cadogan now controlled only six votes in the state of Scalmulligan. Well, he stammered in his bewilderment, well, there, there isn't any news of the old man's son, eh? Again the head clerk replied blasphemously. Eventually Baker retreated in disorder from the presence of this head clerk, having learned that the latter did not give a blank if Caspar Cadogan was sailing through Hades on an ice-yacht. Baker stormed other and more formidable officials. In fact, he struck as high as he dared. They one and all flung him short, hard words, even as men pelt an annoying cur with pebbles. He emerged from the brilliant light, from the groups of men with anxious, puzzled faces, and as he walked back to the hotel, he did not know if his name were Baker or Chumley. However, as he walked up the stairs to the senator's rooms, he contrived to concentrate his intellect upon a manner of speaking. The war-horse was still pacing his parlour and smoking. He paused at Baker's entrance. Well. Uh, Mr. Cadogan, said the private secretary coolly, they told me at the department that they did not give a cuss whether your son was alive or dead. The senator looked at Baker and smiled gently. What's that, my boy? he asked in a soft and considerate voice. They said, 
gulped Baker with a certain tenacity. "'They said that they didn't give a cuss whether your son was alive or dead.' There was a silence for the space of three seconds. Baker stood like an image. He had no machinery for balancing the issues of this kind of a situation, and he seemed to feel that if he stood as still as a stone frog he would escape the ravages of a terrible senatorial wrath which was about to break forth in a hurricane speech which would snap off trees and sweep away barns. Well, drawled the senator lazily, who did you see, Baker? The private secretary resumed a certain usual manner of breathing. He told the names of the men whom he had seen. Yes, remarked the senator. He took another little brown cigar and held it with a thumb and first finger, staring at it with the calm and steady scrutiny of a scientist investigating a new thing. So they don't care whether Caspar is alive or dead, eh? Well, maybe they don't. That's all right. Uh, however, I think I'll look in on em and state my views. When the senator had gone, the private secretary ran to the window and leaned afar out. Pennsylvania Avenue was gleaming silver-blue in the light of many arc-lamps. The cable trains groaned along to the clangor of gongs. From the window the walks presented a hardly diversified aspect of shirt-waists and straw hats. Sometimes a newsboy screeched. Baker watched the tall, heavy figure of the senator moving out to intercept a cable train. "'Great Scott!' cried the private secretary to himself. "'There'll be three distinct kinds of grand, plain practical fireworks. The old man is going for em. I wouldn't be in Lascombe's boots. Ye gods, what a row there'll be!' In due time the senator was closeted with some kind of deputy third assistant battery horse in the offices of the War Department. The official obviously had been told off to make a supreme effort to pacify Cadogan, and he certainly was acting according to his instructions. He was almost in tears. He spread out his hands in supplication, and his voice whined and wheedled. Why! "'Really, you know, Senator, we can only beg you to look at the circumstances. Two scant divisions at the top of that hill, over a thousand men killed and wounded, the line so thin that any strong attack would smash our army to flinders. The Spaniards have probably received reinforcements under Pando. Shafter seems to be too ill to be actively in command of our troops.' Lawton can't get up with his division before to-morrow. We are actually expecting—no, uh, I, I wouldn't say expecting, but we would not be surprised. Nobody in the department would be surprised if before daybreak we were compelled to give to the country the news of a disaster which would be the worst blow the national pride has ever suffered. Don't you see? Can't you see our position, Senator? The senator, with a pale but composed face, contemplated the official with eyes that gleamed in a way not usual with the big, self-controlled politician. "'I'll tell you frankly, sir,' continued the other, "'I'll tell you frankly that at this moment we don't know whether we are a foot or a horseback. Everything is in the air. We don't know whether we have a glorious victory or simply got ourselves in a deuce of a fix.' The senator coughed. "'I suppose my boy is with the two divisions at the top of the hill? He's with Riley?' "'Yes, Riley's brigade is up there.' "'And when do you suppose the War Department can tell me if he is all right? I want to know.' "'My dear senator, frankly, I don't know. Again, I beg you to think of our position. The army is in a muddle. It's a general thinking that he must fall back and yet not sure that he can fall back without losing the army. Why, we're worrying about the lives of sixteen thousand men and the self-respect of the nation, Senator. I see, observed the Senator, nodding his head slowly, and naturally the welfare of one man's son doesn't, uh, how do they say it, uh, uh, doesn't cut any ice? Five and in Cuba it rained. 
In a few days Reilly's brigade discovered that by their successful charge they had gained the inestimable privilege of sitting in a wet trench and slowly but surely starving to death. Men's tempers crumbled like dry bread. The soldiers who so cheerfully, quietly, and decently had captured positions which the foreign experts had said were impregnable, now in turn underwent an attack which was furious as well as insidious. The heat of the sun alternated with rains which boomed and roared in their falling like mountain cataracts. It seemed as if men took the fever through sheer lack of other occupation. During the days of battle none had had time to get even a tropic headache, but no sooner was that brisk period over than men began to shiver and shudder by squads and platoons. Rations were scarce enough to make a little fat strip of bacon seem of the size of a corner lot, and coffee grains were pearls. There would have been godless quarrelling over fragments if it were not that with these fevers came a great listlessness, so that men were almost content to die if death required no exertion. It was an occasion which distinctly separated the sheep from the goats. The goats were few enough, but their qualities glared out like crimson spots. One morning Jameson and Ripley, two captains in the forty-fourth foot, lay under a flimsy shelter of sticks and palm branches. Their dreamy, dull eyes contemplated the men in the trench which went to left and right. To them came Caspar Cadigan, moaning, "'By Jove!' he said, as he flung himself wearily on the ground. "'I can't stand much more of this, you know. It's killing me.' A bristly beard sprouted through the grime on his face, his eyelids were crimson, an indescribably dirty shirt fell away from his roughened neck, and at the same time various lines of evil and greed were deepened on his face, until he practically stood forth as a revelation, a confession. I can't stand it, by Jove, I can't! Stanford, a lieutenant under Jameson, came stumbling along toward them. He was a lad of the class of ninety-eight at West Point. It could be seen that he was flaming with fever. He rolled a calm eye at them. "'Have you any water, sir?' he said to his captain. Jameson got upon his feet and helped Stanford to lay his shaking length under the shelter. "'No, boy,' he answered gloomily, "'not a drop. You got any rip?' "'No,' answered Ripley, looking with anxiety upon the young officer. "'Not a drop.' "'You, Cadigan?' Here Caspar hesitated oddly for a second, and then, in a tone of deep regret, made answer, uh, "'No, Captain, not a mouthful.' Jameson moved off weakly. "'You lay quietly, Stamford, and I'll see what I can rustle.' Presently Caspar felt that Ripley was steadily regarding him. He returned the look with one of half-guilty questioning. "'God forgive you, Cadigan,' said Ripley, "'but you are a damned beast. Your canteen is full of water.' Even then the apathy in their veins prevented the scene from becoming as sharp as the words sounded. Caspar sputtered like a child, and at length merely said, "'No, it isn't.' Stanford lifted his head to shoot a keen, proud glance at Caspar, and then turned away his face. "'You lie!' said Ripley. I can tell the sound of a full canteen as far as I can hear it. Well, if it is, I, I must have forgotten it. You lie. No man in this army just now forgets whether his canteen is full or empty. Hand it over. Fever is the physical counterpart of shame, and when a man has the one, he accepts the other with an ease which would revolt his healthy self. However, Caspar made a desperate struggle to preserve the forms. He arose, and, taking the string from his shoulder, passed the canteen to Ripley. But after all there was a whine in his voice, and the assumption of dignity was really a farce. "'I think I had better go, Captain. You can have the water if you want it, I'm sure, but I, I fail to see, I, I fail to see what reason you have for insulting me.' "'Do you?' said Ripley stolidly. "'That's all right.' Caspar stood for a terrible moment. 
He simply did not have the strength to turn his back on this this affair. It seemed to him that he must stand for ever and face it. But when he found the audacity to look again at Ripley, he saw the latter was not at all concerned with the situation. Ripley, too, had the fever. The fever changes all laws of proportion. Casper went away. Here, youngster, here is your drink. Stanford made a weak gesture. I wouldn't touch a drop from his blamed canteen if it was the last water in the world, he murmured in his high boyish voice. Don't you be a young jackass, quoth Ripley tenderly. The boy stole a glance at the canteen. He felt the propriety of arising and hurling it after Casper, but he too had the fever. Don't you be a young jackass, said Ripley again. 6. Senator Cadogan was happy. His son had returned from Cuba, and the 8.30 train that evening would bring him to the station nearest to the stone and red shingle villa which the senator and his family occupied on the shores of Long Island Sound. The senator's steam yacht lay some hundred yards from the beach. She had just returned from a trip to Montauk Point, where the senator had made a gallant attempt to gain his son from the transport on which he was coming from Cuba. He had fought a brave sea-fight with sundry petty little doctors and ship's officers, who had raked him with broadsides, describing the laws of quarantine, and had used inelegant speech to a United States senator as he stood on the bridge of his own steam-yacht. These men had grimly asked him to tell exactly how much better was Casper than any other returning soldier. But the senator had not given them a long fight. In fact, the truth came to him quickly, and with almost a blush he had ordered the yacht back to her anchorage off the villa. As a matter of fact, the trip to Montauk Point had been undertaken largely from impulse. Long ago the senator had decided that when his boy returned the greeting should have something spartan in it. He would make a welcome such as most soldiers get. There should be no flowers and carriages when the other poor fellows got none. He should consider Casper as a soldier. That was the way to treat a man. But in the end a sharp acid of anxiety had worked upon the iron old man, until he had ordered the yacht to take him out and make a fool of him. The result filled him with a chagrin which caused him to delegate to the mother and sisters the entire business of succoring Casper at Montauk Point Camp. He had remained at home, conducting the huge correspondence of an active national politician, and waiting for his son whom he so loved and whom he so wished to be a man of a certain strong, taciturn, shrewd ideal. The recent yacht voyage he now looked upon as a kind of confession of his weakness, and he was resolved that no more signs should escape him. But yet his boy had been down there against the enemy and among the fevers. There had been grave perils, and his boy must have faced them and he could not prevent himself from dreaming through the poetry of fine actions, in which visions his son's face shone out manly and generous. During these periods the people about him, accustomed as they were to his silence and calm in times of stress, considered that affairs in Skalmulligan might be most critical. In no other way could they account for his exaggerated phlegm. On the night of Caspar's return he did not go to dinner, but had a tray sent to his library, where he remained, writing. At last he heard the spin of the dog-cart's wheels on the gravel of the drive, and a moment later there penetrated to him the sound of joyful feminine cries. He lit another cigar. He knew that it was now his part to bide with dignity the moment when his son should shake off that other welcome and come to him. He could still hear them. In their exuberance they seemed to be capering like schoolchildren. He was impatient, but this impatience took the form of a polar stolidity. Presently there were quick steps and a jubilant knock at his door. "'Come in,' he said. In came Caspar, thin, yellow, and in soiled khaki. "'They almost tore me to pieces,' he cried, laughing. "'They danced around like wild things.' 
Then, as they shook hands, he dutifully said: "How are you, sir?" "How are you, my boy?" answered the Senator, casually but kindly. "Better than I might expect, sir," cried Caspar cheerfully. "We had a pretty hard time, you know." "You look as if they'd given you a hard run," observed the father in a tone of slight interest. Caspar was eager to tell. "Yes, sir," he said rapidly. "We did indeed. Why, it was awful. We any of us were lucky to get out of it alive. It wasn't so much the Spaniards, you know. The army took care of them all right. It was the fever and the you know, we couldn't get anything to eat. And the mismanagement why, it was frightful." "Yes, I've heard," said the Senator. A certain wistful look came into his eyes, but he did not allow it to become prominent. Indeed, he suppressed it. And uh, you, Caspar, I suppose you did your duty? Caspar answered with becoming modesty, Well, I didn't do more than anybody else, I don't suppose, but, well, I got along all right, I guess. And uh, this great charge up San Juan Hill? asked the father slowly. Were you in that? "'Well, yes, I was in it,' replied the son. The senator brightened a trifle. "'You were, eh? In the front of it? Or just sort of going along?' "'Well, I don't know. I couldn't tell exactly. Sometimes I was in front of a lot of em, and sometimes I was just sort of going along.' This time the senator emphatically brightened. "'That's all right, then. And, of course, of course, you performed your commissary duties correctly.' The question seemed to make Caspar uncommunicative and sulky. "'I did, when there was anything to do,' he answered. "'But the whole thing was on the most unbusinesslike basis you can imagine. And they wouldn't tell you anything. Nobody would take time to instruct you in your duties, and, of course, if you didn't know a thing, your superior officer would swoop down on you and ask you why in the deuce such and such a thing wasn't done in such and such a way. Of course, I did the best I could." The senator's countenance had again become somberly indifferent. "'I see. But you weren't directly rebuked for incapacity, were you?' "'No, uh, of course you weren't. But, uh, I mean, uh, did any of your superior officers suggest that you were no good, uh, or anything of that sort? I, I mean, uh, did you come off with a clean slate?' Caspar took a small time to digest his father's meaning. "'Oh, yes, sir,' he cried at the end of his reflection. "'The commissary was in such a hopeless mess anyhow that nobody thought of doing anything but curse Washington.' Mm, "'Of course,' rejoined the senator harshly. "'But supposing that you had been a competent and well-trained commissary officer, what then?' Again the son took time for consideration, and in the end deliberately replied, "'Well, if I had been a competent and well-trained commissary, I would have sat there and eaten up my heart and cursed Washington.' "'Well, then, that's all right. And now about this charge up San Juan. Did any of the generals speak to you afterward, and say that you had done well? Didn't any of them see you?' Why, no, I, I don't suppose they did, any more than I did them. You see, this charge was a big thing and covered lots of ground, and I hardly saw anybody excepting a lot of the men. Well, didn't any of the men see you? Weren't you ahead some of the time, leading them on and waving your sword? Caspar burst into laughter. Why, no, I had all I could do to scramble along and try to keep up and I didn't want to go up at all." "'Why?' demanded the senator. Uh, "'Because because the Spaniards were shooting so much, and you could see men falling and the bullets rushing around you in—' "'By the bushel. And then at last it seemed that if we once drove them away from the top of the hill there would be less danger. So we all went up.' The senator chuckled over this description. "'And uh, you didn't flinch at all?' Well, rejoined Caspar humorously, I won't say I wasn't frightened. No, of course not. But then you did not let anybody know it? Of course not. You understand, naturally, that I am bothering you with all these questions because I desire to hear how my only son behaved in the crisis. I don't want to worry you with it. 
but if you went through the San Juan charge with credit, I'll have you made a major. Well, said Caspar, I wouldn't say I went through that charge with credit. I went through it all good enough, but the enlisted men around me went through in the same way. But weren't you encouraging them and leading them on by your example? Caspar smirked. He began to see a point. Well, sir, he said with a charming hesitation, um, uh, I, well, I, I dare say I was doing my share of it. The perfect form of the reply delighted the father. He could not endure blatancy. His admiration was to be won only by a bashful hero. Now he beat his hand impulsively down upon the table. That's what I wanted to know. That's it exactly. I'll have you made a major next week. You've found your proper field at last. You stick to the army, Caspar, and I'll back you up. That's the thing. In a few years it will be a great career. The United States is pretty sure to have an army of about a hundred and fifty thousand men. And starting in when you did, and with me to back you up, why, we'll make you a general in seven or eight years. That's the ticket. You stay in the army. The senator's cheek was flushed with enthusiasm, and he looked eagerly and confidently at his son. But Caspar had pulled a long face. Uh, the army? he said. Uh, stay in the army? The senator continued to outline quite rapturously his idea of the future. The army, evidently, is just the place for you. You know as well as I do that you have not been a howling success exactly in anything else which you have tried, but now the army just suits you. It is the kind of career which especially suits you. Well, then, go in, and go at it hard. Go in to win. Go at it. But— began Caspar. The senator interrupted swiftly. Oh, don't worry about that part of it. I'll take care of all that. You won't get jailed in some Arizona adobe for the rest of your natural life. There won't be much more of that anyhow. And besides, as I say, I'll look after all that end of it. The chance is splendid. A young, healthy, and intelligent man, with the start you've already got, and with my backing, can do anything, anything. There will be a lot of active service. Oh, yes, I'm sure of it, and anybody who—but, said Caspar, wan, desperate, heroic, father, I don't care to stay in the army. The senator lifted his eyes and darkened. What? he said. What's that? He looked at Caspar. The sun became tightened and wizened like an old miser trying to withhold gold. He replied with a sort of idiot obstinacy, I don't care to stay in the army. The senator's jaw clinched down, and he was dangerous. But after all, there was something mournful somewhere. Why? What do you mean? he asked gruffly. Why, I, I couldn't get along, you know, the—, the the what? demanded the father, suddenly uplifted with thunderous anger. The what? Caspar's pain found a sort of outlet in mere irresponsible talk. Well, you know, the other men, you know. I, I couldn't get along with them, you know. They're peculiar somehow. Odd. I didn't understand them, and they didn't understand me. We, we, we didn't hitch somehow. They're a queer lot. They've got funny ideas. I don't know how to explain it exactly, but, but somehow I, I don't like em. That's all there is to it. They're good enough fellows, I know, but— Oh, well, Caspar interrupted the senator. Then he seemed to weigh a great fact in his mind. I guess—he paused again in profound consideration—I guess—he lit a small brown cigar—I guess you are no damn good. End of Part 19 End of Wounds in the Rain, War Stories by Stephen Crane